What day is it? It's my birthday. It's good to share. But check you have the right privacy settings. Or someone can make a lot of money from being you. breaks down on the motorway, remember one thing, go left. Search Go Left, National Highways. This is a Global Original Podcast. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project designed chiefly to let me spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with somebody that I find fascinating. And uh, I think it's fair to say, Charlotte Church, that you fit into that category. Oh, thank you very I, much. I, do you know, I used to be a showbiz, newspaper showbiz journalist. Did you and, really? I, and I never did any of the bad stuff yes. that, that you were exposed to at the time. But I almost feel that as a representative of that profession that I owe you an apology. Oh. Oh, my love, Bec- don't, it's well, fine. <laughs> well, because just reminding myself of, of some of the stuff that you went through as a, as a younger woman and as a girl, it wouldn't happen now. Mm, I'm not so sure not, about that. Not as badly. I don't know. Really? I think, it's, I think it's just like, it's a bit more insidious now. It's just gone underground a little bit okay. more. I think that yes. before, because of the, the, the culture back then, everything was quite you know, brash and brazen and irreverent and especially sort of tabloid journalism. Yeah, maybe. So I think that actually it's still happening. You know, it's still you know, that toxicity. But yeah, absolutely. It's just a little bit more um, sly. So how conscious was the sort of... the Because you never really stepped away from it. You, however, to younger listeners, you won't be anything like the household name you are to people of my age. When I was showbiz editor of the Express, you were, you know, one of the most famous people in the country and certainly in the context of newspaper coverage, one of the most um, live Mm. people in the country. How conscious was the stepping away a little bit from the public glare? I think that... um, I don't know if it was that conscious, actually. I think... um, But but I clearly needed to do it. But I, I think that because I had kids quite young um, and and I mean, I, I still was doing stuff. Like yes, no, I know, I know. When I had Ruby and Dexter, yes. I, I did I did a Channel 4 talk show. Yes. And, um, but yes, I was, it was certainly, I think it was like a, a mother instinct. It was a protective, a protective lioness sort of thing where I was like, actually, I really want to protect my cubs from mm. this nonsense and you have and uh yeah <laughs> no but you mean successfully they're, yeah. they're, they're 14 and 12 now i think yeah 14 and, and 13 now 14 and yeah, 13 he's just had his birthday and i think that um uh I, and then i just really enjoyed it yes then i really enjoyed not having to be a part of that circus um and the you know, sickening, almost daily occurrences that would happen. Yes, of course. Um, because, you know, when, when we people would phone us up and be like, there's a story about this, oh. or, you know, what's your comment on your father doing this, or whatever, it was always like, yeah. you know, that yeah. really, like, sick to your stomach feeling. So I was like, oh, this is really nice, actually, just mothering my babies, living out in the country, making some, like, really... Uh, and compromising music and and exploring some artistry, you know, and really being creative. And so I, I think I, I was always busy. I was always doing stuff. Mm. Um, and then I got really heavily involved in the anti-austerity campaign yes, and know. all sorts of different stuff like that. So it was not like I was completely out of out of the public eye, but I was just out of mainstream culture, I think. When we, we mentioned to someone that you were coming on the programme and it turns out they've got a cousin who lives near you, 
and and they said, oh, she's great. She she goes, if there's any cause that needs a bit of um, needs a bit of help, oh. then everyone always goes to our <laughs> Charlotte. Totally. She'll, she'll, Can you do this? Can you open this? Can you? But you, I mean, you protest against Donald Trump's inauguration, as you say. You're very, very vocal on the austerity stuff. It's um, it it, it, it it's nice, I imagine, for you to be part of causes rather than everything being about you. Oh, absolutely. I think that. I started, it was the Leveson inquiry that really right. politicised me. Yes. Um, and to be honest, it was then that I just, the reason it politicised me is because I started to see the corruption. But you were a victim of phone hacking. And, 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 and Absolutely. And you received just over half a million pounds, I think. In, from... Yeah, me and my fa- me and my parents. Yeah. Um, but it was the, um, it was the corruption that was, you know, throughout press and yeah. politics and the police and how they all interwove which was you know through through going through the Leveson inquiry and um you know hearing other people's testimony and starting to really understand the da- the depth yes. of that corruption just made me sort of sit up and go oh this is systemic and this is yeah. really not okay um and then it's in the marrow of the country isn't it as absolutely. well because I, I mean you can imagine if you were shot i'd i'd was in that world and had no idea just yeah. how absolutely incestuous it was, particularly the the police newspaper relationship and that kind of thing. Yeah, was... absolutely. And so, um, yeah, that was the thing that politicised me. That was the thing that sort of really ramped up my feminism yeah. and just made me go, you know, just really care, have deep empathy for the injustices of the world and how it was affecting real people. And I just wanted to do something then at that point. Um, so, so that's how it started. And then um, it sort of transferred a bit then from humans to nature. Sure, yes. <laughs> I mean, humans are an intrinsic part of nature, but, um, you know, to sort of Mother Earth and then capitalistic practices and, you know, and, and, that, and that sort of became where I want, I, I've turned my attention since really, um, yeah. We've jumped forward. I'm going to smash rewind in a second. No but, worries. But, but before we do, it's as if your education is backwards, isn't it? It's as if because you were, when you were growing up and the age when you would have been at high school and at university, you were too busy being an international superstar. You've inhaled knowledge and learning once you finally found a little bit of breathing space in your life. Yeah, but I don't think learning happens like that. I think, you know, the learning that I did from 12 to 16 when I was, you know, in the White House looking at how the Secret Service operate or, you know, <laughs> singing at an orchestra or yeah. in this in, intensely pressurised position of, of having an, an inter- interview with a really hardcore journalist or, you know, being there at a business meeting yeah. where they're discussing, you know, uh, contractual obligations of mine at 14. All wow. of that stuff or the culture of Japan or, of you know, I, I travelled so much and yes. I had, I was exposed to so many different sorts of experiences that, wow, that was real learning. Um, and I was still, I had two tutors, so I was still doing my geography and my history and all of the rest of it. Um, but the real world learning I was getting was was really amazing. But then I suppose, yeah, in in part, there were def- they were definitely uh, gaps in my um, academic knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, sometimes my husband will say something and I'll be like, oh, no idea, <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, didn't you do it in school? And I was like, I didn't do science in school because we couldn't do practicals on the road. So Gosh. I just dropped science. Um, but yeah, the the we're, we're constantly learning. Aren't we? Well, you know, on a good day, I think, or at least you know, some of us are. Um, let's let's start at the beginning then. Um, in in Landaff, at home, and the first inklings that you were possessed of a of a gift that would be. I think um, my whole family is musical, like singers, um, and so it was just quite normal for like kids to get up at family parties and. So I sang, I think I sang Chick, 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 Chicken. And um, they couldn't get me off the stage. Yeah, but uh, that doesn't mean you were good. I No, but I think it just gave the that first, like, they couldn't get me off the stage. Like, I was absolutely, 
loving it. And then my mum said, when "How old I was, are you? Were you? Two, three years? Yeah, old? yeah. Right, I think right, I was right. three. Okay. My mum said when I was in nursery, I would come back from nursery and know all of the words to all of the songs in the charts. Oh. Like I had just like sucked up all of that yeah. um, melodic information. Um, so she said that was odd. Right, <laughs> just a bit. Um, and and yeah, like singing was just quite quite regular. But not just singing, to hear you say that already. So it's it's not just about having a voice, is it? It's about there's something else. There's got to be some the, the magic is is what pushes the voice to the White House. It's mm-hmm. and that love of being performing, that love of already kicking in. I think so. Yeah, I think. In a nice way. I mean, you weren't. You were never kind of stage schooly. No, I. But I. Th- in a way, I think that it was f- my auntie Caroline. Yes. And I'd grown up watching her sing. She was a cabaret singer, and um, I just watched her and idolised her. And she'd do all sorts of different charity shows, and and I would be there at all all of these gigs, and and just I, I just absolutely idolised her and mimicked her. Um, and so I think that that's where it first started, just sort of wanting to be like her. Um, so how did that phone call to this morning come about then when you sang P.A. Yezu down the phone line? So I went to a singing teacher when I was nine because my auntie had nodules on her voice when right. she was quite young. Yes. So she said to my mum, make sure you get a train. To so already now you were, it was going to be a career. It was, you were all, I mean, potentially, you were already thinking... Not necessarily. No, but an option, a possibility. I think it was more for... Because she'd had a bad vocal experience. She just thought, I'm going to be singing, or she thought she's going to be singing. For yeah. Us. You better try and yeah, make sure that she's one in doing the it properly so she doesn't hurt herself, basically. And how good, how do you know how good you are, Charlotte, at that stage? Because, you, you, you know, you worship your aunt. You can clearly carry a tune, to coin a yeah. phrase. But, how, how, I mean, when do people start saying to your mum or to your auntie, this, this isn't just a talented kid, that this is. You go to a teacher and they, they say something, or did that not happen? I, I just I think it was I was doing a chari- a church charity social. Right. St Mary's Church in Canton used to have a yearly big talent show. Yeah. And um, there was dancers and singers and magicians, all loads of them kids, some of them adults, like just really amazing I love all that community. Stuff. I, I wish there was still more of that. Oh, around. totally! It was so forming, um, and. I was on there, I was singing Ben by Michael Jackson, which is not great right now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I, somebody had recorded it, one of my family members had recorded it, and then my, I remember my Auntie Caroline playing it back and back to me because on one note I had vibrato, right. which is the shaky stuff in yeah, your yeah, voice. Yeah. The <laughs> difference between la and la okay. is vibrato. Right. And so on one note I have, I have vibrato, and so she kept, um, rewinding it back, go and see, you've got vibrato there. Rem- how did you do it? Can you remember how you did it? Um, and so... Um, and so, she's thinking, aye, aye. Yeah. Is she? <laughs> I think she's just going, this is how you sing properly. Yeah, like, yeah. This is how but you've you done it nicely. naturally. That's come instinctively to you. Yeah, but only on this one note. Okay, yeah, but still. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I, um, yeah... And then I just, after going to singing lessons, my voice totally changed. I went from being this big belter singer and my singing teacher said, no, we're going to start. And we sang Somewhere Out There from American Tale. Yeah. Beautiful song. Yeah. And she made me sing it as quietly as I possibly could. And then over my my weeks and months with her, I just started singing it with a bit more oomph. Um, until, you know, this sort of classical yeah. voice came to the forefront. So... Yeah, and I suppose it was then, actually, when I started singing that sort of classical stuff, went from musical theatre mm. and then started going into more... Why was that? Um, I think it was just the what my singing teacher It was did. the teacher's influence, because it yeah. wouldn't have been a natural course to go down for, for a child that age. You would have carried on singing show tunes, wouldn't you? Well, really? I would have carried on singing Whitney yeah. and Mariah yeah. and... Um, So she did that sort of stuff as well, but I think she was just exploring with me. So she would, so I would be singing Irish airs and Celtic songs and, you know, religious sacred music and then more operatic stuff and show tunes and, and pop songs. It's the month when everyone's mind is fully focused on love. So tune in for brand new Celebs Go Dating on E4 and the great entertainment doesn't end there. Oh no. 
as well as celebs finding love or finding themselves in cringeworthy encounters, E4 is packed full of new entertainment and bingeable programs like Teen First Date, Celebrity Big Brother Australia and The Real Dirty Dancing. Brand new Celebs Go Dating, Monday to Thursday on E4 and catch up on all four. This is the weirdest thing about you, isn't it? Because you're so, and I mean this as a proper compliment, you're so down to earth. But you're, this is proper rarefied musical absorption and fascination, isn't it? It's it's like a, it's it's almost a duality. There's there's mm. the, the 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 singing you is. I don't know what word I'm looking for. Almost timeless or ageless, uh. and and but the way you talk about that, and and the way that you would at that age have sung in Latin, and mm. just it would it all came so naturally. I oh, think absolutely, that's incredible. Did you have any inkling of how incredible that was? I mean, there's no other kids doing that, was there? I mean, I suppose I did in a way, because having, because I had such a fuss was made of me for it right. for a long time. But you would have loved it even if they weren't making a fuss, I, I sense. I adored it. Yeah. I loved singing. Yes. I would practice in my room for hours. My mum hardly like had to tell me to practice. Like I was, I just yeah. loved it. Um, and it it's it's immensely soothing. Yes. Um, and so I, I'm really passionate about everybody singing. I think when people look at what you later went through and thought, how the hell did she hold it together? And I know there were times where you probably wondered whether you were going to, but that's the first mystery solved for me is that you always had your singing, regardless of what other other shit was going on. Yeah, you always had your singing, and it's spiritual. It, it speaks to your soul in a way that insulates you and protects you from anything else that's going on. Completely, okay. it is a total bomb. Wow, a total bomb, and just like a the quickest connection to self. Yeah, that yeah. that you can possibly have. There's something you know innately vulnerable yes. about it, but but so you're just you're just connecting with something other that that isn't that isn't of this world, you know. And I think that's not just me; that's everybody. That's that's an innate capacity within everybody, and we knew it. You know, we've forgotten this um, information yeah. as when we were indigenous peoples. Sure. Um, everybody sang all the time. It was a massive part of your day. Um, and I think we need to bring it back because I think that it's a really easy, free way to help people with their mental health. And that's sure. that's what we've always done. Yes. We've we've explained our lives and our feelings and our emotions through yeah. song um, it's tied up in religion, isn't it, for the good for the good reasons as opposed to the bad. But when you think about, you know, some of the most important times that you've ever had in your life, James, yes. a lot of it will be attached to music. Yes. Or like the really, you know, if if you've lost or if there's been a funeral or a wedding or, you know, there's a there's a song, there's always mm. a song. So, I think that the more we can weave music and song and singing throughout our lives, it's it's just like a, a really free, ever present balm to the soul. And uh, and you, you know, the bigger the voice, the bigger the balm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so back to the PAEZU down the, down the phone. So back to the so PAEZU. You were eleven when that happened. I'm eleven. I'm in my nana's. I've just got a scholarship to the cathedral school, yes. which is a posh prep school where I'm where I get a scholarship because as a girl chorister, um, and I. I get, I get terribly bullied there because I'm poor and right. we've got this shitty fiesta that I the, the doors don't open from the inside so I have to climb out of the boot every morning <laughs> with my Tesco blue striped crisps. Um, yeah, so that was fair. You laugh now, but it's not, it's not, it's horrible at the time, isn't it? That, it was, and I left. Yeah. Um, because of that? Because of bullying. Because it was unbearable. Yeah, they were terrible. Um, I did. I, I stood up for myself at the end, though, and right. gave the one boy a piece of my mind. Um, <laughs> but so, so our holidays. Where is he, where is he now? Um, s- somewhere being in- incredibly rich, I think. <laughs> oh well, never somewhere mind. Being incredibly rich and <laughs> capitalistic, I imagine. Um, but the, so our school holidays were longer, yeah. which is why I think I got through in the first sure, in the first yeah. I- instance because there was a phone in for talented kids on this morning, which incidentally I've literally just come from. Yes, I've I just know. done you this said morning, when you were um, and so with Richard oh, and Judy, tur- how the world turns, eh? <laughs> and so I phoned in, and but I didn't tell 
my nana. I right. was at home with my nana and my auntie Caroline, um, and I just phoned them, and I just sang over the phone. And it was only when then when they said, "Can we speak to an adult?" So and I and I think because it was it would have cost a lot, I didn't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> so then I was like, "Oh no, I've got to tell my auntie Caroline." <laughs> Um, and so I was like, can you speak to, there's somebody on the telly on the phone. So she was a bit confused first of all, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, and then they explained to her, oh, your niece seems to have just phoned in, but we'd like to put her on the air. And so I did. And I sang Piezo over the phone and then they were like, can you come in? That was on a, the Friday. And then I went in on the Monday. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, one of my first TV appearances, but the one that sparked my career was that my auntie Caroline yes. got on to the big, big talent show, which was Jonathan Ross's yeah, sort of, of flagship talent show. Yeah. And um, she was on there singing her original song. And I went on there to introduce her because she had introduced me onto this morning. Okay. And so I introduced her. Jonathan Ross said, I hear you sing as well. And uh, I said, yes. And he said, can you give us a blast? And I did. And one of the producers then um, sort of heard me and contacted some industry people, mm. and um, and the rest is history. And how quickly did it? Oh, it was boom, boom, boom! It happened did, so quickly. And you must have, I mean, pinched yourself. Well, what's the phrase you'd use? I mean, you must have I almost got carried up by a tornado and it, like Dorothy know, and the Wizard of Oz. I think for my parents it was like that. Okay, but for me it was far more. Oh, what's happening now? Okay. Because that's what you do as a child. I guess you're, you're right. constantly in the present. Yeah. You're not thinking about you don't have the context really. Sure. Um and so, you know, I was just go you know, going just wa flow. wandering about, going with the flow. It's Tuesday it must be New York. Totally. But I'm that sort of person anyway, I think. Yes. Um well, when your own children were that age, Charlotte, did you ever sort of stop and think, Crikey, that was my, that wasn't normal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did sort of go, wow, this... I, I did um, think about it often yes. when they were 12 or 11 and 12 and 13. So you went off like a rocket. Yes. You? I mean, you went from unknown to, as I've said, one of the biggest names in the business. Yeah, and it was quite global as well. I like, I did a lot of work in America, yeah. and so I was travelling all over the world for four years. Yeah. Um, and it was it was amazing. It was hard. It was hard work, um, but it was amazing. Like like when as a family, when we look back, especially at that early time yeah. of of how it was and the experiences that we had. Go on, pick um, a couple. Give us a couple of. Oh. Especially for like my my thirteen year old will be listening to this and and the stuff that will just make her go. Oh. I remember I had just turned 14, I think, and I uh, went to the MTV Awards in New York. Yeah. I had to go with my mother, which was deeply embarrassing. <laughs> and I was presenting an award with Wyclef Sean, who was one of the biggest rappers at the time. Yeah. Um, and I was presenting the award to Eminem, no. um, which was amazing. I think it was his Marshall Mathers LP, you know, Buster Rhymes was there, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, like everybody. And David Bowie, we had a photo with David Bowie, which my mother was losing her mind over. <laughs> Iman was there, and oh my gosh, she was so beautiful. So, I mean, it was just like we were so, um, you know, common. Yeah. <laughs> we were so common, and we were so in awe and excited by everything, but we were often like, you know, just nowhere near sophisticated or refined enough to be in these situations. Um, but but that was great. It, it didn't it didn't matter. We weren't like, or I certainly wasn't self conscious. I think my mum would get quite self conscious a lot of the time of like, oh gosh, how do I behave in this? Situation? But then she's got the thing of looking after you, which would crowd out some anxieties, wouldn't it? Because yeah. she's got you front and center, and you're so tight with your mum. You've always been so tight with your mum. Yeah. But. If she'd been there in any other circumstances, the way you describe it would be incredibly intimidating. But because she's got her protect my girl thing front and centre, she yeah. probably manages to keep 
the really crazy stuff in perspective. Oh, totally. But also, I think that, you know, in those sorts of showbiz events, it was just so exciting. Yes, of course. It How was can so it not exciting be? to it's be like there. being in the telly, isn't it? Totally. <laughs> but we'd, we'd be there. Somebody would have put a, you know, given us a beautiful dress to wear. Course, yeah. We might have got our hair and makeup done. It was all so new for that first two years. I mean, obviously, you get used to it and it becomes sure. normalised. But for that first couple of years, it was just all incredibly exciting like i said a lot of work we were tired a lot of the time because we were you know flying here there and everywhere and then uh, it was it was great when my dad joined then because about a year in my dad joined um and that was brilliant it puts you in a different category to a lot of other child stars um, having that pastoral care having mum and dad both completely committed to looking after you yeah absolutely because it i mean it protects you from some of the nastier elements of the industry, doesn't it? Oh, more than, totally. More than anything else. And the exploitation, whether it's financial or worse. My mother was um, a total protector. Both of them were, yes. you know, in their different ways. And they sort of, you know, they they didn't follow the traditional, you know, gender roles of, you know, my dad being there at business meetings and my <laughs> mother there ironing in my stage clothes. It was totally the opposite. <laughs> you know, my dad would make sure everybody was well fed and watered and be packing and make sure we hadn't left everything everywhere. And my mother be there in the boardroom, you know, playing hell with, yeah. the, with the lawyers and the whatever. And she, um, she loved it. She absolutely loved it. Like I've always said to her, she should have been a manager. Oh, but she never would have. No, but she but stumbled she, into that world left, of her she, own back. Yeah, but she probably she could have. No, I know, but that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. And that's that's the it's like scholarships. They can take you and put you into scenarios you may not have got into through, you know, natural progressions. And it turns out you're more gifted at it than the people who were born to the manor. Oh, absolutely. She was like. I love that. She was analytical and she would spot a mistake and she was she was she was amazing that did get difficult in time you know when I wanted to start taking control of my yes. own affairs a bit more of course and she was like you know there was a bit of a power struggle then but but is that part of the I mean listening to you talk about your mum and we'll get on to that in a moment the sense that anything was possible because it's so crazy so quickly and yet you're taking it in your stride, because as you say, you're living in the present as, as, as children do. Everything is normal to a child because it's all you've ever known in yeah. a way. It's, it's, but there must have been somewhere in, in the way your mum and dad handled everything, a belief that anything was possible. Why shouldn't she fly to the moon? Why shouldn't she be? Which some parents wouldn't have had, perhaps. Some parents would have... You talk about being bullied and, 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 and the background, and you use the word common, which made me wince a bit because yeah. I... But there was never any sense of, well, this isn't for the likes of us. There was never any sense of, no. we're, we're, we're flying too close to the sun. No. That's, that's special, I yeah. think. Yeah. No, not at all. I think that, like, um, you know, my nan was a very sort of um, Catholic yes. woman who would have, you know, was a bit more like, you know... Um, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't yes, and, and 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 like keep yourself. Yes, that's a, a what bit I'm, of a mystery exactly and a I'm bit dainty to, yeah. and all of this, that, and the other. Where uh, yeah, my 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 mum and dad were, you know, um, absolutely like, let's go for it. And particularly my dad, because I remember about fourteen, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I don't like doing this. This is this isn't the music that I want to do anymore. Um, I've had enough. And my dad sat me down and said this doesn't happen this doesn't happen to people hardly ever and this doesn't happen to people like us very often right like the you, you, the 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 money that you could earn in this period and the life that you can make for yourself like this is this is such a singular opportunity yes and he got it yeah and i was like oh, yeah Okay, You're and right. and I got it, and and he was like, you know, I think you just have to do this for a little bit longer, and then you can explore, you know, the creative avenues and stuff that you want to, because you know, it was at that time when I was about fourteen that I just wanted to be a part of the culture of my peers, and singing sacred religious, you know. How did you have peers music. then? Because I mean, we just. So from 11 to 14, it, it, it's from from your nan's sitting room to international superstardom is the shorthand version of it. Yeah. So how did you have peers? How did you have... 
I still went to school. Yeah, but you wouldn't be out at weekends and stuff like that or what, no, what did you when, but I did. when did you first start feeling you were missing out on things even though what you were doing was about 14. Okay. It was about 14 and so I'd still go back to school um and you know I had a group of girls a group of friends and when I was home we'd go to the ice hockey oh, you, and okay. meet up with the boys that. I didn't and you were still yeah drink hooch you know <laughs> whatever it might I heard be of that for a while <laughs> so so we still did that and then we'd meet up on a saturday and go to town and all hang out in the same sandwich shop and where well, one, I mean, one of the, the friends work okay, right i didn't know that that answers the question perfectly how, how how did that work i mean is that is that people you'd known all your life who would Tell you when you were getting a bit above yourself, or you're not in Hollywood now, Church. Or, or... I I never used to get above myself. Did you not? Ever. It was it was really interesting actually because at, at that age you're all egocentric. Yes. So they don't give a flying fuck what I've just done. Are you serious? Yeah. The fact that I've just gone and you know sang for a president, or you know, I mean, they're interested in in stuff like if I've met Justin Timberlake yeah, or whatever. But the gossipy whoever. stuff, the stuff they'd be interested in if it was in Smash Hits. Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay. But the rest of it is just like whatever. Anyway, did you say that so and so did this to so and so and blah blah blah? <laughs> so and so's with so and so now, and so they just catch me up on the gossip, and all of that became totally irrelevant. Fantastic. Totally irrelevant. They weren't in. Interested. I I yeah. knew not that the, these weren't two cultures to be mixed. Right. Okay. Um, and but sometimes they'd come on the road with me as well. Right. So if it was school holidays and stuff for them, they'd come out to LA or Australia, um, and come and hang out and be in my world for a bit. Yeah. Um, Tight friendships then, special friendships. Yeah, absolutely. What about jealousy? So you know, you'd be at the ice rink, and presumably you'd be a target for some local. Yeah. Or not. I mean, maybe not. I, I mean, no, absolutely. Yeah, there was... There was. It's not normal to see someone times. walk into the room who's just come back from giving an MTV award to Eminem. Yeah. In, in... There was loads of times right. when, when people tried to fight us. Okay, there you go. There <laughs> <laughs> Loads of times that people tried to fight us, but this crew of us, <laughs> and there was probably, I mean, that's a bit older now. Yeah, okay. Well, no, actually, no. 14, 15. 14, 15. Off, yeah, there, there's a crew of us uh, of about, I don't know, there's about eight girls maybe, and they protected me. Right. Because at that time, the press interest as well started. Yes. Bits and bobs of paparazzi would come down to Cardiff. Um, and so they were fiercely protective over me. And also, but we would all, you know, like this. So we would all like just constantly like, <laughs> don't fucking talk about me like that. How fucking dare you? Who do you think you are? No, 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 no. <laughs> and if, and if, and if, if one of your mates was the target you'd have been straight in as well uh, so. well i don't know I'd, no. I'd keep i'd keep my nose clean i had to no, well, i didn't mean it I didn't, I didn't mean you'd be <laughs> lamping people or, or just, no i just meant that you'd you'd be protective of your friends if someone if a boy was treating them badly oh or totally like that. You, that, yes. that, that, that kind of oh sense absolutely of, i mean there was those times as well exactly. but that, that was later you're more than a small business so MailChimp made this more than an ad. It's also an operetta. MailChimp has a smart marketing platform with marketing automations, smart recommendations and creative tools that all work together to help you sell more stuff. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. We're now in the kind of uh, the, the the beginning of the well, I suppose you know the, the the tougher times then when you mentioned the paparazzi have started sniffing around yeah uh, almost literally I mean uh, some of the stuff you endured was I, I still think it was breathtaking although I take your point about saying it just goes on in slightly slyer ways yeah um, can you remember thinking aye aye things are changing or or does it happen so slowly that you just wake up one morning and things have changed it's only with um you know, a retrospective look that yes. you can really see the the enormity of a shift, yeah. you know, and how, um, but yeah, at the time you just, it's confusing. Yes. Um, you know, that time in your life is deeply confusing anyway. Oh, you are deeply confused. Yeah. You are really trying to search for your identity and who you are. Yeah. Never mind your identity and who you are being sort of looked at and dissected and sold and, you know, as mine was yes. and commercialized. So it was just deeply confusing. I just remember feeling, 
very confused a lot of the time and and angry a lot of the time again how much of that is puberty and how much is is the situation um so your two oldest are about to or just have just yeah (laughs) absolutely it's fun (laughs) yeah but to see that and think crikey think it's tough enough when you're living a normal life yeah to have that exacerbated by the abnormal nature of your existence. Then. Yeah. It's, it's almost unthinkable, isn't it? Yeah. But as you say, from, I mean, throughout, it's, it's all you know. So yeah, confused and angry. Yeah, totally. And, um, but again, you just like, you just get through it, don't you? You have to. You well, know? not everyone does, Charlotte, to be honest. Yeah, but this you, is I mean, true. You know, um, and I, I'll give a couple of examples for people who don't know. It's not pretty, but the Sun newspaper were counting down to your 16th birthday, at which point you would become legal, yeah. as, in, as in the age of consent. Yeah. I mean, this was never... Um, uh, apparently, this doesn't exist because they couldn't find it. Right. But the Sun when you did, went to Leveson. Yeah, the Sun did manage to... I remember it. Yeah, um, uh, delete a lot of uh, of its wrongdoings, um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a general. There was a general sort of vibe of, you know, my burgeoning sexuality then being sort of tittle tattle or yeah. titillating for, you know, why you? Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think that it's a that's a deep question. Mm. You know, which is about youth, yeah. Um, and it's about how only youth is seen as beautiful in our culture, um, but also forbidden, and all of that stuff as well. And so you just had that sort of salacious um, and defilement, maybe. Yeah, to totally. Go from being angelic to being sexual is, but but also like you know. It is a it is a natural progression for a a woman to start feeling those feelings and wearing those things yeah. and starting to explore and it's a beautiful thing, you know, a, a, a burgeoning sexuality and all that that means. It's such an enriching part of life. That it's such a great bit of humanity. Of course it is. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it was again like like deeply shaming in a in a way that I've had to start to really unpick yeah. in in my later life um so you yeah have therapy? Do you, have you, I've never I've never had therapy, never had therapy. You speak I really that. need it <laughs> well, yeah, you do not everybody do. I did but I don't know that you do because you seem to have some people have an ability almost to do it to themselves and it sounds like you've got that or well, at least you've developed that I also think in part because I've been doing interviews since I was 12 yes I've been talking about my life experience and sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, not in the not in the deepest, most personal realms in which therapy explores, which is why I still definitely need therapy and I will explore it. Um, not least because I'm setting up a healing retreat centre. I oh, need to be exactly. able to deeply go into yeah. my wounds. But for me, it's a different process. It's about nature. We'll okay. come to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but... Yeah, it was that the the interviews I think were quite cathartic. Yeah, of course. So you're examining what's going on around you, even when you don't realise it. You're just trying to get to the end of the interview. Yeah. Sometimes. So this is this is the the, the kind of, I mean, period where you couldn't blow your nose without it being in the newspapers. Yeah. Um, you personal relationships were picked over every single element of your existence was considered to be fair game i don't know that anyone can ever understand that who hasn't been through it it was terrible i had my, you know my first not my first boyfriend my first boyfriend was lovely my <laughs> second and my third boyfriend sell sex stories on me when i was 18 19 yeah. like that was soul destroying like such a betrayal and you know the how you know, do you find out does someone ring you or do you Oh, they, they they always ring you. The press always ring you to let you know what's going to be coming out. And do you have a comment is the thing that they do. Again, I can I can feel it now starting in the pit oh of my God. stomach, that ugh, that feeling of like, oh, yeah. it's terrible. Um, so I'm, and, and then what they did to my mother and my father and my close family members and my friends, yeah. like they had tapped all of us yeah. and everybody was fair game you know some of the things that they the you know the ways that they described my friends in in newspapers when we were like having a girls holiday away, away in Ibiza absolutely despicable you know they were not fair game at all right. i wasn't fair game to to be abused in that way it was horrific and then my parents and the way in which that went was i mean just like unconscionable 
absolutely unconscionable. And and I think that's why at the Leveson inquiry, even though it was like, this isn't ne- this isn't going to be pretty. Um, but I was just like, I felt such a fierce. Yeah this is the right thing to do. There's been such an injustice done here, not just to my family, but to families all over the country. And, you know, this was just, we had, you know, a slightly positive part of it, which was, you know, the early life and the fame and the exploration and all of that for a family who's just had a horrific crime committed against them, who get put through that same thing. I mean, it's just insane. Like his belief, doesn't it? Mm. It's, it's, Sienna Miller spoke about the trust and the fact that stuff was appearing in the newspapers and it could only have come from one or two people, which meant she doubted the fidelity of her mum or, or I forget, you know, like the people closest to her. But of course, people were actually listening to to their voicemails. Also, like, I am absolutely positive it was more than just voicemail listening. Right, I'm absolutely positive. I'll never be able to prove it, but there were conversations that I had which were almost verbatim. Um, but you then begin to think that the person you've been talking absolutely. to Absolutely. You start looking at your friends, you start looking at your And your boyfriends members. have been selling the stories anyway. Exactly. So like your levels of... Your most tr- intimate moments have been turned into copy. Exactly. So it was just like, again, like immense confusion. But I think in a way, I <laughs> probably quite sociopathically, I, I was so determined to live a normal life yeah because my nan used to say um god rest her soul i'm talking about her a lot today um oh she'd go to church and stuff and she'd be like it's terrible me going to church and people you know and people know that you've been falling out to nightclubs and why can't you just have a drink at home with your friends why oh, do you have to go out why do you have to wear that why do you have to do this yeah and i'd be there every sunday going nan I've got to, I've got to live my life. Like I've got to well, live. Where did that come from? Because you could have gone the other way. You could I have... don't know. I think. I mean, nobody in my family is a shrinking violet. Sure. Like there are there are a lot of extroverts and such in my family. Um, but I don't know. Maybe there was just some sort of innate. Um, uh, rebellion. Yeah. And and my rebellion. Oh, was, you won't be put in a box. Yeah, but my rebellion may, was sort of turned against the media yeah. and convention okay. of the time. So, you know, I wouldn't have, uh, 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 you know, be, uh, be as skinny as, as all of the other beautiful, yeah. famous women or, yeah. Yeah. you know, I wouldn't go and, you know, it, take myself off to the VIP clubs where I knew I wouldn't be papped. Like, I was just like... So um, like I like I don't I that's not my life. I'm not that glamour so it's showbiz like, come person. On then, almost or not? No, come on then. It was def like if I'd have, if I'd had my time again, I'd box way more clever. Right, okay. But how can you <laughs> Totally be, how can but it was just like, you know, this is uh, particularly when it was done in Cardiff, it was like this is my hometown. Yes. You know, I, I don't want to have to sh- hide away. No. Like, these are the places me and my friends want to go. This is the best R&B music. <laughs> so you're almost becoming a kind of, almost an enhanced version of yourself in order not to be cowed. You're so determined not to be cowed by these people. You possibly put the accelerator down a little bit harder or not? Well, yeah, I think I just flip the birds. Yeah, there you go. I, I carry on. And yeah. it does hurt me. You know, it does hurt me to do that because of, you know, the the way in which I'm seen as such fair game then. Right. Okay. Uh, um, so if she behaves like that, then we're allowed to do this. Not if she behaves like that, but there is certainly like there, you know, I could have had a drink on a Saturday night with my friends at home. Yes. Or I could have gone to the VIP clubs in London yeah. or New York yeah, yeah, where yeah. you know I wouldn't have been bothered. But, you know, my friends couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't have much fun. Exactly, sense, exactly. Know. VIP clubs are boring. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not all of them, but they have their moments. I, I, but they, also, I, I think I really shunned, <laughs> like, I didn't, sometimes, like, but, celebrities would get in touch with yeah. me and try and be friends with me and stuff, and I'd be like, I don't want to be a friend. I've got friends, thanks. I, I wouldn't ever say that. I wouldn't sure. be that rude, but I was just like, 
just because you're famous and I'm famous doesn't mean we should be friends. But in a way, again, that yeah. was sort of stupid because well, uh, yeah. there were people that were really nice and reaching out and, that's and why art- artists and I probably would have had a lovely time with them. Yeah, but you it's almost you were aggressive in your defence of your normality. So you, you had to have your normality because people who reach out to you have got the shared vocabulary of celebrity which is not something anyone else gets and it's why so many marry each other and and yeah. you know it is possibly why your relationship with Gavin Henson was so successful for the period that it was successful was because you could both know what life in the public eye was like so yeah. i get why people do that i didn't used to even when i was a showbiz journalist I thought, why do they all hang out with each other yeah. but it is because they're the only people it's a common how experience are you gonna, how are you gonna know that you know in the 18 19 yeah well? totally like and yeah and i just thought i just thought that they would all be like inauthentic terrible humans yeah. and so i didn't even give them the chance no, i get that i understand <laughs> If, did, did, I mean, the temptation to knock it all on the head. I mean, if even if you could have done, presumably this is the period in which you sort of felt, I don't want any more of this, or would that kick into the f- flipping the birds as well and you'd be... Because um, there's this, this weird contrast, isn't there, between the determined, Charlotte determined to be normal and Charlotte who just isn't. So did you ever want to pick the normal life and forget about the abnormal life? Um... I don't feel like that was an option. Okay, so you wouldn't even entertain the thought. But also, like, at that time then, like, I finally got to start doing some of the music that I want to do. Yeah. Not not the pop stuff, the pop stuff, but, I like, I was obsessed with R&B. Like, I yeah. really, I would have gone way further down at R&B, like, Jill Scott, D'Angelo, I mean, I wish, sort of route. But that's where my heart was lied. You know, that's yeah. the music that I totally loved. And so in my mind, you know, that's, that's where my career path's going now. Now yeah. I get to do, you know, explore creatively the music that's really in my soul and that I really want to do fantastic um which never quite happens never Why quite not? comes to fruition because I, you know I can't go from you know Charlotte Church you know sacred music singing voice of an angel to you know like new soul R&B because people get confused and they don't like to see their yeah but also I, I don't know it just wouldn't like the pop the pop route was seen as okay, okay. and so the, the the record company like had a like the A&R had a lot to say yeah. about who I worked and with and what you and, can do and what you and what I could do, do and what but I couldn't do oh no now what do I do go Go left, find an emergency zone. Go left, don't forget your phone. Go left, out the passenger door. If your car breaks down on the motorway, remember one thing. Go left. Search Go Left. National Highways. Don't want to sound patronising. It's easy to forget how young you still are. Yeah. There's still loads you I mean, we'll get... I'm almost 36. Yeah. I don't feel young. No, well, I was <laughs> I was 50 last week. Were you? I feel about 14 and a half on the inside. I keep waiting oh. for it to kick in, and it, I don't think it ever does. If but, it was going to, it would have done by now. But that's wonderful. I, I think, think so. I hope keep, so. To keep that sort of childlike wonder and play is where it's at. I hope so. Um, tell me a little bit about when you started to exert your own authority or independence on with your mum on the on the kind of business side of it and wanting to I think that it just got to a point where we were living in each other's pockets yeah. she was you know I, I want I wanted control I yeah. wanted to start to control my life I didn't want to um le- be led or guided and you know there's no two ways about it as well she did get like a bit powerful (laughs) and I was like no no I'm not having that and it was and it was a wrench it was terrible um they were so protective of me like reason like in in a totally reasonable way that they couldn't let go so the point at which you didn't need protecting that much oh I still did yeah but not as much as they would have protected you when you were 12 yeah, but still, like, can you imagine your no. your teenage girl, you know, then all of the newspapers start no. all of this nonsense? No, of and actually, 
you know, you're, he, there, there's, there were police that the police came to us a couple of times with stalkers and kidnap thro- threats. Yeah, yeah. So it was quite a physical threat. So they can't let go, can they? There's yeah. Not, it's, and, it's, and then all, you know, all of the media and stuff. So their, their protective instinct is still there, maybe even more so in, in other ways. Yes. Um, be- because now I am starting to go out and, you know, do all of that stuff and move away from them. Okay. And they couldn't let go. And so in the end, poof, yeah. I just, I cut the bonds, I cut the ties and it was really painful. I'm sure it was. I think it, it, I mean, it was really, really painful for my mother. It was painful for me, but my pain was, was different because I had all of this freedom. Mm. So, you know, that was joyful and, you know, I was having a brilliant time with my friends and, you know, having my first flat and all of that stuff. But, you know, it still was painful for us for a while and that's, that's still playing out. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Did it have to be so final looking back? Was that was that the only way it would have worked? No. No, again, if I'd have had my time over. Well, there's two, it takes two to tango. So I, I, I haven't met your mum, but I imagine that neither of you were going to back down if I've read this relationship even vaguely correctly. Yeah, I mean, my dad would be, my dad. The peacemaker. Would, yeah, would always be the sort of compromising element. Um, but he was still like, you know, uh, you need, to, I needed to protect you. Yeah. Like you are literally at a physical risk. Yeah. No, yeah. you can't go and do that. And, you know, no, you, you have to be back by this time. And I need to pick you up from that place. Mm. And you need a bodyguard now and all of this stuff. And I was just like, ah, come on, uh, leave me alone. What age is this? 16. So I'm, I'm, I, le- I left home when I was 16. See, mine, my oldest is 16 in the next few days. And, I mean, <laughs> what were you thinking? I know, I know. <laughs> I, I was having a ball. Yeah, well, there is that, there is that <laughs> side of it as well. There is that side of it as well. Um, uh, you know, again, that that is probably what... Um, where... If I had have let my parents, sure. you know, protect me yeah. a little more, and we could have worked it out, but I, you know, it, it, it wasn't going to be the cookie crumbles as it crumbles. It doesn't it just doesn't um, it just. So yeah, it was a it was a really, ooh, it was a wrench. Of course, for for everybody, but also like I just needed to be free. I just needed to to be, you know free to explore yeah. who I was and what I wanted to do and 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 you did it's fair to say it is. <laughs> isn't yes. it um in in a sort of in all senses really you, you you know you lived your life that you wanted to live yeah and you know again it was like without my mum to be there as my fearsome protector against you know, these gnarly record industry or, you know, all of the different people, business people that I was working with, that then, you know, when I was there by myself, and of course, you know, I had representation and management and that sort of stuff, but, um, yeah, it, it, I... Lonely? Well, it, it, I got... Who who filled that space? Did you fill it all yourself, the space left by your mum and dad? No, I did. I had, you know, I had a PA. But they're all on the payroll in a very totally. Way. It's I mean, a totally it's, different relationship. Yes, exactly. And and I get, you know, I get hurt. Yeah. I get hurt. I get fucked over, and I make bad bad business decisions, right. and people manipulate me, and all of that stuff that you'd imagine happening yes, if a sixteen year old is in business by themselves. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, even though I was a pretty savvy 16 year old by that point. Sure, you're not a shark. Yeah, exactly. And um, also, I'm totally hopeful and naive, um, which I still remain to this day. You say naive, you mean trusting? Yes. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those weird dichotomies, naive and trusting, isn't it? Because it's good to be trusting, but it's not good to be naive. But I you can't really is, be trusting without being a bit naive. I think that naivety is great. I think in, in the purest sense of the word. has a bad no, rap. Uh, no, you're, you're quite right. In the purest sense of the word, as in kind of believing in good and believing. Yeah, yes. but also like a lot, a lot of the things that we ever do, which seem 
you know, far too big and grand and difficult to, you know, that actually there is a, a mountain to climb that you realise once you've climbed it. it. All starts with naivety. You're right. When, when did you relax then? Uh, when did I re- have I ever? I don't think I've ever relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I when I was pregnant with my babies was that it? Yeah, when I was when I was the pregnant, planets aligned. Yeah, and I was just like, ah, oh, this is amazing. I loved it. I loved the process of being pregnant. Um, I just just that that mother bubble yeah. is just exquisite. And were you back on better terms with your own mum by then? Mm. That's a shame. Okay. We t- we go in and out really. We, our, our our relationship had repaired somewhat. Yes. But I was I was quite physically distanced at that okay. point. Like I was living about it was only it's only forty minutes down the road, but yeah, you know, it's forty f- minutes down the road. Totally, yeah. considering yeah, we yeah, live yeah. five minutes away and sure. we're constantly together all the time, yes. it still feels like a bit of distance. And you know, and, and that distance was never her choice. Right. It was okay. always my choice, I think. And this is where, in, in a way, where the interview began with that moment of becoming a, a mother, being the kind of almost feels like a journey's end almost mm. and 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 also a journey's beginning because you now have you're still performing you perform with your husband and and um and a band very much on your own terms yes. festivals <laughs> but why are you laughing because i mean just because you've played everywhere yeah that doesn't mean it's not cool to be playing smaller places does it no I, no not at all you love it i love it yeah it's so much fun the pop dungeon is yes Exceptionally, the late night pop dungeon. Such as late night pop dungeon <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> is about as much fun as as a human can have. And and now you've bought a big, to paraphrase Blur, you've bought a big house in the country, and you're turning it into a into a retreat, which involves coming back onto things like this and being on this morning. Yes. So there's no conscious withdrawal from that world. It just ceased to be part of who you were and what you were doing, and now. It's going to become. Is it? I mean, the two are linked intrinsically, aren't they? You're here partly because of the new show, the new. But project. again, it's only sort of accidental. It's not. Well, you know, I was talking to um, Discovery about a totally different program. Okay. And explained, and they were they were just asking, "What are you? What? Hey, hey, how's it going? What are you doing at the start yeah, of the yeah. Zoom conversation?" I was like, "Oh my gosh, I've just taken on this. Blah 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 blah." And well, don't blah blah blah. Tell us what it oh, is. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I've just taken on this amazing house in the heart of Wales, which Laura Ashley used to own, yeah. um, which has 47 acres, 33 acres of beautiful woodland, two waterfalls. I mean, it is exquisite. The nature there is amazing. Mm. Um, one of the, I think it's the second darkest sky in Britain. Red kites circling above. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Ab- absolutely majestic place. And... Um, I saw it. I was only meant to be looking for a little field somewhere to start some glamping business yeah. <laughs> because I because I I came to the conclusion of I t- I'd had all my money in stocks and shares and stuff sure. which had become more ethical over the years okay. as I had wised up. Yeah. But but then I got to a point where I was just like, why am I? I don't believe in this system. Like I don't want to be a part of this system at all. I want to invest in the land. So. Um, the point was that I was going to, you know, buy some parcels of land yeah. and sort of start a glamping business because I also didn't want to be reliant upon showbiz money. Okay. Which is, you know, volatile. Yes. And so yeah. I, I wanted to create something which was in line with my values. I wanted to put my money somewhere which was in line with my values. Um and create an amazing experience. Like I love holidays and I love nature and I I'm really becoming much more interested in how we heal and yes. how nature heals us. And yeah. anyway, so these were the thematic things in my mind. I saw this house; it was way above my budget. I completely fell in love with the land, um, and I decided that I was going to start a retreat center. Um, so for whom? Hmm. For all sorts of people for people who are burnt out because of tech, for um, working burnt out mothers who are sad, for 
men who don't know who they are as men anymore um, and what it means to be a man for the uninitiated in all forms um, for people who are totally disconnected from nature and themselves uh, which is a lot of people <laughs> so I just I've I've had I've had this experience in my life and I think in part because of having kids mm. and in part because my eyes became opened to nature as a balm um, that I'm so passionate about saving humanity, which is the task that we all face now. And I'm just trying to do the work which is required. So rather than being a poster girl anymore really um, or going into politics or you know being the person who's banging their drum about anti-austerity or climate yeah. change I just felt like I wanted to do something grassroots that was real one person at a time one person at a time and okay. that's that's also what the Alwyn Project is about which is um, a charity that I set up which is a, a parliament of children in the woods yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a. I'm, I'm setting up free to attend democratic um, uh, learning communities, which are often based. Well, we've only sure. got one at the moment, yeah. but which is based in the woodland, wow. um, where kids, you know, children's rights are right at the centre of it, and we are helping children and their families figure out what's the best route in terms of how to how they should be educated what they're interested in because, what their interests are because one size fits all is 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 murder one size fits all is murder but also like consent of is course. never sought mm. like it is not so not only uh, is the is the way that the mainstream education system um done uh not following the science of learning mm like we know a lot now about how humans learn mm. and the different ways in which humans learn but commonalities amongst mm. how humans learn a lot of that is about feeling that you have agency feeling that you have control um and being interested generally mm. helps a lot but also it's about relationships so when you ask somebody about how they found school they'll generally talk about a teacher yeah. that's the first thing they'll say i love this subject because this teacher was amazing yeah. and they really you know made me feel whatever um, so we know a lot more now about the science of learning, which just is not implemented in the mainstream because the mainstream is run on the ideology of whatever government is in power. Or, or, or just on the status quo that's been in place for 50 years. I exactly. Mean, keeping... But also I think that, you know, I, I, I don't want to do the mainstream a disservice. I know there's a lot of amazing people working there. Um but and it's such a Goliath, you know. It seemed as such a juggernaut. How do you turn around this juggernaut? So, what I'm trying to do is create an alternative. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating because it, it, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people who would look at the world in a, in a in a certainly on the question of injustice and inequality. They'd be very much in the same space that you are, but they feel that their energies and their talents are best used doing the stuff on stage doing the I mean in the case of Jolly and Morn from the Good Law Project he, he wants to fight the court cases not to go into parliament or be a politician in, in the case of other people they become a focus or a rallying point whereas you want to get your hands dirty you want mm. to get down and actually do it I don't know that one is the right way and one is the wrong way oh, but totally. this is the right way for you absolutely absolutely and all of these different facets are needed you know there's a lot to sort out in this world yes, but I wonder also if because your your sort of success and your fame was one point removed from the people that gave you success and fame you were performing to them there's a mm. distance now the people that you want to make differences for you want to be able to see and and be on the same page that they're on. You want to be but I think there's closer a, to the action. There, but there's also something innately more creative about doing it this way. You know, rather yes. rather than it being, you know, a, a common script that yes. that, that, that we're yes. all talking about in order to raise awareness or whatever it might be. This is something that feels like, you know, it's creative. It's community building. It's 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 a, it's what my heart sort of clearly. sings for. Yeah, clearly. Um, Shines out of you. And and <laughs> and it's these amazing kids and families whom lots of lots of them have really struggled in mainstream, um, and where 
they well the kids have renamed themselves a tribe um so we were first when we first started we'd registered as a school it was in the annex of my house so we had a proper building yeah. and everything yeah. when covid hit um we lost some oh, of our funding sure. we couldn't rent the building we were going to use so then we um we formed a partnership with the Woodland Trust yeah. and they gave us a parcel of land. And since then, we've been out in the wilds and it's great. <laughs> and how often are you there? I'm there probably once every two weeks Fantastic. volunteering. Um, that's been sporadic the last six months because I was crazy busy filming the show and stuff. But this year, I'm definitely there once every two weeks. And for a while, I was forest school teacher. So, so there's two things going on. There's the academy and then there's the, the retreat. And the show is about, essentially, at, at the moment, it's it's about getting it ready to become a retreat and learning that you have to, for example, have locks on doors and stuff like that. You don't have to have locks on doors, well, James. You keep saying that, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> But, but that so I mean, how much of that is going to go on? I think it's we're about two weeks into it now. How much? Yeah, there's eight. There's eight episodes. And are you all done and dusted? I don't want to. No spoilers. But no, it, no, no. So we watch did not this. get to the end. <laughs> it is not finished yet. It's on. It's on really and Discovery Plus. Yes. Um, and it does. I mean, regardless of how it came about and the fact that you were talking to them about other things, it does sort of, from where I'm sitting, signal. A, a, a bit of a step back into a, a different kind of spotlight. Definitely. Yeah. And it's been, uh, oh, not awkward, but I am, I am trepid. Yes. Um, but actually when I said yes to that and then, and then I started to realize the ramifications right. of it. And then, you know, I, and I've started saying yes to a few other things yes. in part because I need to financially, like yeah. I've got to finish this build. Okay. Um, but, but also it's like, I, okay, I've got, I do have stuff to say. I want yeah. the Awen project to grow. Yeah. My visibility can help. Right. That um, yeah. I want to make this um, this retreat center a success. I want it to help a lot of people, um, and so. But but yes, I do feel a little bit like a little shy woodland creature coming out, okay. like hi. <laughs> Is everyone okay? <laughs> I know COVID was a bit tough. But here, um, here we are. So yeah, that's how I feel at the moment. It's probably not how I'm coming across at all. <laughs> no, well, it, it isn't. It isn't, and and. You, you never didn't enjoy this side of it, even though elements of the media were horrible to you. You never, because you mentioned, you never didn't enjoy being asked nice questions by nice people. Totally. But also, and crucially, even though the press yeah. could be terrible, there was some elements of the press which were lovely. And the general public, 99.9% yeah. .9 of the time, especially people who come up and speak to me, are absolutely delightful. And that's nice. And it's lush. Mm. And so I I have such faith in, in people and humanity. Um, and, you know, like sometimes my dad's like, oh, I think you've got a bit of a skewed version of the world because people are always so kind to you. Right. But particularly in person. Yes. Um which is all that really matters. Yes. Fuck the rest yes. of it. Um, I know what he means, but but we're back to the beauty of naivety again, aren't we? Yeah, and I am still really naive, and I'm happy to keep myself as that. Long may it long may you stay naive, <laughs> Charlotte Church. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. <laughs> <laughs>